Good morning again. I love this start. I had not seen it, so it's like very exciting. Uh, we are entering in a new sermon series. You know that we learned these past four weeks about the four loves that are mentioned in our scripture. We learned that the four of them were very important, are very important, but that the fourth one, the agape love, the all-encompassing love, really describe best God and his love for us. And when we know about this love, we want to be more like him. And we want to follow him. Because let's face it, if we don't follow him, we are going to follow after something or someone. And it's quite amazing that in this age of technology, those two terms, following and follower, have taken magnitude. I mean, social media, right? So you follow your family members, and you follow your friends, and you follow the friends of your friends, just in case you don't know something about your friends. <laughs> and then, of course, you follow celebrities. But you know that when you follow them, you only have a very small glimpse of their life. Because people, and I do the same, post just one thing, things that we find exciting that we want others to know. But that doesn't give you the whole, does it? Now, just in case you want to know who is the most followed in 2020, I have a graph for you. And maybe you know those names are very small, uh, but let me tell you that Instagram as the social media platform is the most followed of everything and anyone. It has more than 327 million followers. And then I'm just going to give three names, I mean, because they are so small you couldn't see. I mean, most of them are musician and high-profile people, sportmen. So uh, Ronaldo Cristiano as a soccer player, Ariana Grande, The Rock, uh, Dwayne Johnson, those are the first three, and it's like hundred millions of people that follow them. But even though we are kind of crazy in our 21st century to want to know what people do and how they dress and what they like, I believe following has another element, and I think it's very important for each one of us because we follow people that we want to emulate. We want to be more like them. We want to be as good or as talented as them. And let's think about it. If we want to be as good a piano player, let's say, than Tom or Marie, right, it is not possible to just sit and get a good book about how to play the piano. We have to follow the master. We have to ask Tom and Marie, Marie, can you, you know, teach us? We want to be more like you. And you know, it is the same as we want to become real, genuine followers of Christ. Now, this past weekend, it seems like a century ago, but last Friday and Saturday, we were able to go to Washington, D.C. and visit our youngest daughter, Camila. Now, visiting Camila is always a treat, but many times it's also an adventure. So she had booked for us a session on coffee cupping. I mean, do some of you know what that is about? I didn't know, but I trusted her. And so it is a session where you learn how to taste well coffee so that you can choose the best coffee and, of course, get them to drink the best cup of coffee. So she introduced us in this bougie type little restaurant in Washington, D.C., the master cupping, so that we would join about 12 of his other disciples that were learning how to do cupping. And so uh, we had in front of us uh, a series of three cups and four sets of them, and brought, uh, the person brought uh, four of the best coffees from Ethiopia. It was a whole ceremony. 
So we had same amount of ground coffee, and I think we can see some pictures there, in each one of the cups, and then hot water was poured upon them. Then you had to wait four minutes to allow for the fresh ground coffee to come up and form a layer. Then we disciples became active. We had to crack that layer and smell the coffee to see what, it, what the aroma was like. Then the layer was totally taken away and then we were able to taste the coffee. So you would take a spoon of the coffee and you had to slurp it. <laughs> Just making this disgusting noise, but it was the best way that you could have the taste of your coffee in most part of your mouth. Now we also learn, right, that from there, you know, we could go to the second coffee and, and again do the same. We even learned that as you let the coffee rest, the flavor slightly changes. It becomes a bit sweeter and so on. Now, you hear me talking about it. I'm not a master yet of cupping, but I'm telling you what, I'm getting closer to it these days. <laughs> but what I know from that experience is that if you want to become good at something like coffee cupping, it's not that you go and you get the best of the coffees, or maybe a cupping how-to-do book, or even a video that will show you how to do it, because if you only do that, what you're going to do is learning by trial and, uh, and error, and you don't really know what you're looking for, what is expected. So here is the advice, find yourself the best teacher, the best master, and then see and learn and experience and then be ready to also teach others how to go about it. You may become a master coffee cupping and we may need some of you in this Lehigh Valley too. Now, applying that same idea on how did the first disciples become followers of Christ who also saw and learn and experience and then shared their witness in such a way that 21 centuries later, here we are, followers of Christ or people open to become followers of Christ. So let's go to the passage that we have today to learn about how they did it. It comes from the Gospel of John, and it is in the first chapter, verses 35 to 47. The next day, John, and we're talking here about John the Baptist, again was standing with two of his disciples. And as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, what are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated the anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas which is translated Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, 
we have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. A little bit skeptic, Nathaniel said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? You tell me, right? Philip said to him, come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. This is the word of the Lord for us this morning. Now, it seems that for me at least, there are three questions that emerge from this text. And the first one would be, how do we start following Jesus? That's the first and the, you know, the initial question. The second one is, why do we follow Jesus? We need to know the purpose of our following and then comes the third question, how do we become genuine followers of Jesus? Now, we can see in this passage that two of the first disciples, Andrew and a disciple that we don't really know the name of, heard about Jesus from a very trusted source. It was their friend, it was their teacher, John the Baptist. And we even know that it wasn't the first time that John the Baptist spoke about Jesus to them. If we had read before that text, we would know that. But even in that text, we have those three words saying, the next day again. So we know that uh, John is speaking again about Jesus. Jesus exclaims, look, the Lamb of God. Now, if somebody tells us the Lamb of God nowadays, we may think, Hmm, that is strange. What does that mean? But if you were a Jewish person, believer, you know, you would know that that meant that that person was going to take the sins of other people so that they would be able to be forgiven. And that was something that only God could do. So amazed at that, Andrew, at the other disciple, just leave John and start following Jesus. Now Jesus here steps behind him and he turns and sees them and asks this question, what are you looking for? And the two disciples, gently and humbly, say, Rabbi, where are you staying? And that is a very culturally Middle Eastern appropriate way to say, we want to be with you. We want to get to know you. We want to be guests in your home. We want to learn from you. And Jesus immediately invites them, come and see. Now, I wonder if we can learn from this Andrew that is mentioned, how to really start following Jesus. Who was Andrew? I mean, Andrew does not seem to be a very influential disciple. We don't see his name many times in the gospel. We see it a few times. One of the times when we see this name, if you remember the scene where Jesus was teaching to a crowd of more than 5,000 people, it gets late, it gets late, and Jesus is asking the disciples about feeding them. Now, Andrew is not among those that say, hey, Jesus, maybe you haven't noticed, but we don't have the money to really feed all these people. Send them away. Let them go home. They can just fend for themselves. No, Andrew, because he has these incredible networking skills, he has already seen who is there. He knows a few people, and he found this young man that has fish and bread loaves and he points that to Jesus, and Jesus takes it from there. But does that make Andrew an important disciple? Well, I think it does, and for many other reasons. So stay with me here. In this passage, I think that Andrew has his minute of fame, right? He is the first that is named 
as a disciple and who follows Christ. So the first named. That requires courage, right? And then he was the first disciple to use his great networking skills to spread the word. And he started to the one with the one that he has closer to him, his brother Simon. Now Simon, who is renamed Peter by, G by Jesus, is one of the most influential uh, leader in the, the Christian church, the early Christian church. He is the rock upon whom that church is built. And then third, he is the one that claims that Jesus is not a simple teacher. He is the Messiah, the one that they were looking for. That's a lot. So Andrew is a man of action. He is a person that wants to know God. And you know it because he has already been looking for the best teacher he knows. He is uh, studying under a high-profile um, spiritual leader, John the Baptist. Even if John is quite controversial. But it seems that Andrew doesn't care about John the Baptist being controversial. He wants to find the best because he wants to be pointed to God, to Jesus, to that Messiah, right? So Andrew pays great attention to what John the Baptist is telling about Jesus. He has heard now John tell him about the experience that he had when he baptized Jesus, and then he heard God's voice saying, he is my son. Whoa, the son of God. And then he hears about the Lamb of God. And John, who is one of the greatest spiritual leaders, also says, you know, I am nothing compares to this Jesus. I am not even worthy to untie the thong of the sandals of Jesus. And you know, a slave could do that. Anybody could do that. So that picked the attention of Andrew. Andrew desires to become a disciple. He wants to be a follower of God, so he seeks and he remains with the master to experience firsthand what it means to be a follower of Christ. So I'm wondering, what are the steps that you are taking or are you taking any steps to follow and learn from the best, from Christ himself, not just what other people think about Jesus, not even what you think about Jesus, but going to the source, to Christ himself, going to scripture in prayer with a small group or a Bible study group. Imitate the first disciples. They wanted God. They wanted to know the Messiah. And they knew with whom to apprentice, and that was Jesus, the Messiah. And once they found the teacher that could give them unsurpassed instruction, they went with it. What are you going to, who are you learning from? There is no point of learning from the second best. When you have the best, go for it. And now we come to the second question that we had. Why would we want to follow Jesus? I mean, Jesus wanted to know that from those two men that were following him. And that question, what are you looking for, just goes to the heart of the question. He knew, and we know now because we have scripture, that many people would follow him because they had personal needs. They had personal requests. And it's not that Jesus does not want to respond to those requests. In fact, he healed the, the sick and he feed the hungry. He has mercy upon those that come to him. But he also warns the crowd that follows him that they need to follow him for the right purpose. And so we see some of his words 
in the Gospel of John, a little bit later, John 6, 36, 37, we hear that master saying, very truly, I tell you, you're looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life. Now, other people followed the master because they wanted power. And can you believe that that happened even among the 12 disciples? In the Gospel of Mark, we see two of those disciples, John and James, son of Zebedee, that go to the teacher and say the following, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Now, that's high bar. Whatever we ask. Now, Jesus, stay cool, you know, and ask, okay, what do you want me to do for you? And then they say, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. Now, the response of Jesus, you don't know what you are asking. You don't know. If that was not power-seeking, I don't know how to call that. Now, other people just followed him because they wanted to just feel things for sensationalism. They wanted to experience the thrill of seeing the signs and the miracle, that excitement that comes with that. And I believe that maybe some of the people that, you know, go to churches or, or go to conferences go because they want to experience these mountaintop moments. But what happened? That after the mountaintop experiences, come the valleys. Do you quit that teacher? Where and how and why are we following the master? Do we follow because we want a positive response from him to our personal request? Are we seeking power and glory? Or do we want to experience those mountaintop moments? Or do we really and genuinely want to explore, want to know Christ, want to learn from him, and then be able to be transformed, maybe going like Andrew did when he first understood that Christ was not only an amazing teacher, but he started to understand and believe that that teacher was in fact the Messiah the Son of God, the Lamb of God, the one that Moses and the prophets had spoken about. Don't place following Christ on a waiting pattern. Don't say to yourself, even in your mind, well, that is a good idea. But you know what? I don't have time. Places to go, people to see, maybe later, Jesus. Don't go there. Start following Christ to know him. Now, from that step, how do we then become more like Jesus? How do we follow as real followers, as real disciples? I think it implies using the skills that we have learned as we remain and study with Christ in scripture or in small groups. You do not keep those skills. You give that to Christ and you add the God-given skills or talents that you have already. Sure, Peter never mastered that water-walking skill. Let's face it, right? But he and his brother Andrew were amazing fishermen when they met Christ. And Christ, Jesus Christ, used that skill by giving them a new look at life and then sent them to be again fishermen. But this time, fishing for people, for God. And they got really good at it. Now, so allow the master to give you a new look at life. 
Allow him to teach you and to use your God-given skills to share with others who God really is in Christ. Knowing Christ is not something that you want to keep secret. In our passage, we see three men, John the Baptist, Andrew, and later, later Philip, that show us how they share about Christ. Now, can you just imagine, as you are maybe sharing with a young man, maybe that man becomes the next Billy Graham, or a young woman, maybe becoming the next Mother Teresa, or just simply men and women, youth and children that can be impacted and transformed from the inside out because you have given them a chance to hear about who Jesus is. Don't take away that opportunity. Now today, we are going to celebrate and send a team of 12, that's a good number, right? 12, 12, like the first disciples. 12 men and women from this congregation that have said yes to following Jesus in Houston. They're going to Houston to use the skills that they have and maybe learn new skills to bring hope, to bring that knowledge of Jesus to families that are still struggling after Hurricane Harvey. But what are you going to do? How are you going to follow Christ? Are you going to take the time you need to know him, seeking, pursuing him, accepting his invitation to become a vibrant follower? Do not be content to simply say, well, I'll do what I can but rather be amazed as you invite and you accept yourself the invitation of Christ to see what God can do. Do not be content in simply following rules that are easy to obey, clearly marked, safe, smooth, at least in your understanding. Following Jesus is like a journey filled with strange and exciting opportunities to see God in action, maybe outside the road that we thought, outside the map that we thought we had pretty clear in our mind and that we are examining. You will follow him as you open your heart. You will learn from him. And you are also invited to bring others by saying to them what you know about him. Are you ready? On your marks. Get set. Go. Father, we want to go. Teach us how to really follow you. Father, we want to be courageous. We want to learn from you and take the time that we need to take to honor you and get to know you. And then, don't keep it as a secret, but go and share with others who you are. Father, I praise you for people like Andrew and others that allow us to be nowadays your disciple. Use us, we pray. It is in the name of the Master Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen.